Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs, the IIEA, in Dublin. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar entitled En va où maintenant? The Post-Election French Political Landscape. This event follows up on a great meeting we had in April that looked at the implications of the 2022 French presidential elections with our distinguished panel, who I'll introduce in a moment. And our meeting today will focus on the French legislative elections, which took place in June. And our speakers are going to consider uh, what this might mean for the future of France, for Ireland, and indeed for the European Union. And we are delighted to be joined today by two of Ireland's preeminent experts on France, Lara Marlowe, Paris correspondent at the Irish Times, and Dr. Emmanuel Sean Quinlevin, lecturer in European politics at UCC. We greatly appreciate both speakers again taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us to discuss France and where the Republic goes from here after uh, these tumultuous elections. Lara and Emmanuel will speak for approximately 10 minutes each, and then we will go to questions and answers with our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion as usual using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send any questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll get through as many of them once our speakers have concluded their remarks. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. As always, please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. But before formally introducing our speakers, and indeed before handing the floor over to them, I want to briefly present the electoral landscape as of today. So I'm going to share my screen very briefly. Now, so just before we get down to business, I hope this will be useful to prevent our speakers from having to paint a picture. This is the composition of the 16th National Assembly. Uh, we have 10 political groups split across three broad groupings. The centre led by President Macron and his Renaissance, formerly La République en Marche party, and allied groups. These remain the largest in Parliament, but have lost their overall majority and now lead in a minority capacity. So it's the yellow bit there in the middle. On the far left in purple, we have the loose intergroup known as NUP, and I was just discussing with our speakers before the varying pronunciations you can have in French, but I will refer to them as NUP, which are the New Ecological and Social People's Union, which is formed of the La France Insoumise, the Socialists, the Ecologists and the Communists, led by Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who seemed like an insurgent winner of the election, but they already may be fracturing. And finally, on the right, it's worth pointing to the third grouping we have after the resurge for the Rassemblement National under Marine Le Pen uh, to their best ever results, and due to the failure of the NUP to form a single group, now the largest single opposition party in Parliament are indeed the Rassemblement National, as I expect our speakers may refer to. So to formally introduce our speakers, Lara Marlowe is a Paris-based foreign correspondent for the Irish Times, and as a journalist for more than three decades, working for Time magazine, the Irish Times and others, Lara has lived in Paris, the Middle East, and in Washington, DC. She is a, re a recipient of the Légion d'Honneur and has written three books, including her most recent Love in a Time of War with Apollo Press. I'm sure many of you will know Lara as well for her excellent and fearless uh, reportage from Ukraine over the course of this uh, recent horrible conflict. Dr. Emmanuel Sean Cunlevin, as mentioned, is a lecturer in European politics at the Department of Government at UCC, where she teaches French politics, comparative politics, and European policymaking. Dr. Sean Cunlevin also holds a chair in active European citizenship and is the director of UCC's hub in active European citizenship. Thank you both again for being with us, and I'll hand first over to Lara. Lara, the floor is yours. After 10 minutes, over to Manuel. Thanks both. Thank you, Barry. Um, I thought I would start with <clears throat> talking about the news today, uh, which is the UberLeaks scandal and Emmanuel Macron's um, implication, if you like, in, in that scandal. Both the Rassemblement National and NUPS or NUPES are demanding a commission of inquiry in the National Assembly uh, over Macron's role. Um, as you know, I think it was something like 124,000 documents uh, released by an Irishman who was a lobbyist for Uber. And 
this just confirms what many, many French think that Emmanuel Macron is the president of the rich, that he's a sort of Trojan horse for big capital, for multinationals, uh, and so on. So it is creating a very uncomfortable um, position for Macron. It turns out that in 2014 and 15, when he was the minister for the economy, he negotiated a secret deal with, with Uber uh, to help to deregulate the French taxi uh, sector. Uh, and so this is, this is really the main news story here today. Uh, Macron's kind of retort to that is he's gone um, somewhere, I think in central France to open a semiconductor factory showing that he is still the champion of, of high technology and, and so on. Um, uh, the Rassemblement National, the, uh, Le Pen's party, is saying that he's the defender of the oligarchy, uh, which obviously has you know resonance with the war in in, in Ukraine. Um, he is certain to be questioned about this in his Bastille Day interview two days from now. Um, oh, the the best quote I found was actually from Fabien Roussel. Uh, the communist uh, deputy in the National Assembly who said that um, the president of the Republic wants to impose an American model of a startup nation in France. Every time he chooses multinational corporations, the world of business over protecting the French. Uh, and, and another thing, the French really hate lobbies um, and the, this idea that Macron was in cahoots with the Uber lobby that they were making secret visits to his office at Bercy. Uh, I don't think it's going to change anyone's opinions of Macron, but it will certainly reinforce um, all of the stereotypes about him. Um, since, you know, I guess you could say that April 24th, the day of his reelection was a very good day for Macron, but it has really been downhill since. Uh, there was a Cantar poll at the end of June which showed that his, his um, approval rating had gone down for four successive months in a row. It, it went down uh, six points in the last month alone. It went down 11 points since April. He's now at 32% opinion rating, which in France is not that bad, but it, it's not great. Uh, but at the same time, Marine Le Pen has been going up and up and up. And the same poll found that 39% of the French say that they want her to play a more important role in politics in, in the future. Uh, so what will the future be? Um, there was a vote of no confidence yesterday staged by Mélenchon's group, by NUPES, um, which Elisabeth Bourne and the government won by a very wide margin. They only got 146 people to vote against the government out of 577. But perhaps the most interesting thing was that six socialist members of the NUPES coalition abstained in that vote. And that just opens a tiny crack of possibility that <clears throat> in the future when uh, Bourne is, and, and the, the majority are trying to get those 39 votes that they desperately need to pass any legislation, perhaps they can rely on a few socialists. Remember, Elisabeth Bonn came from the Socialist Party and there are other um, former members of the Socialist in Macron's coalition. Uh, for example, Clément Bonn, who a lot of Irish people would know as someone who's very uh, hibernophile, who went to uh, TCD and uh, is now the transport minister. Um, but I, I think that the lesson of the, the confidence vote and also the other main news, which I'll come back to in a moment, which is the law on cost of living in the National Assembly. The lesson of all this is that parliamentary politics is back in France. Uh, it had pretty much been anesthetized for the first for Macron's first term because he had such a, a large majority that nothing really happened here. And although it's, it's happened in a fairly brutal way, and although a lot of people are, are shocked uh, that the, the far right has two vice presidencies of the National Assembly, that NUPES, uh, the far left, have uh, the presidency of the Finance Commission. Despite all this, um, I hear around me in government, among government people, politicians, analysts, everything, people say this is a healthy thing. This is actually good for French democracy. Um, the other thing that's back is the whole 
left right division. Uh, remember that Macron said that it was it no longer had any meaning that the, you know the, this was the, la, la fin du clivage politique. And what the debate on the, the um, no confidence vote showed is that there really is a left right division in France. Um, will uh, I, will Nupes, I mean, will the opposition actually manage to uh, overwhelm Macron? I don't think so, because the main reason for that is that Nupes and the Rassemblement National are, are pretty much incompatible. Um, they, they don't really agree on anything and they have a completely different approach to being in opposition. Uh, Le Pen's group wants respectability. And for example, she's told her, dep her 89 deputies, they must wear suits and ties, they must dress you know, in a very conventional manner. Um, they even said that the reason they didn't vote um, to censor the government was that they want to act to help French people not to create problems for the government. Uh, whereas with the, the NUPES, the far left people, uh, the objective is really to create as much problems for Macron as they can. And the danger for Marine Le Pen, of course, is that they will seem, be seen to be too conciliatory, to be helping Macron, and, and that people who voted for the RN will move to New Paris because above all, they, they hate Macron and they, they, but so, you know, it's this obstructionist attitude versus a constructive attitude. Um, that will be something to watch to see how that um, plays out. In any case, an anti-Macron united front is, I think, very unlikely. They disagree on everything. They disagree on the, the nature of the French Republic, on fighting racism and Islamophobia, on gender discrimination, on class struggle, the environment. So they, they, they don't really agree on anything. They also both, they have, uh, they have the same goal, which is to prove themselves as, um, co as what's the word, credible uh, alternatives to Macron. They're thinking about the, the 2027 presidential election, which a lot of people think is the only election that really matters in France. So they're, they're thinking about that already. Um, in her, uh, on July 6th, so six days ago, Elisabeth Bourne gave her general policy speech. And by all, all virtually all analysts thought she came through it with flying colors. Uh, they praised her seriousness, her pugnacity. Uh, she, she had to speak over a lot of shouting and heckling and, and that sort of thing. Um, so she, she performed very well under pressure. Uh, Bourne is also, having to cope with four men who, who the Le Monde called crocodiles, uh, who are in, in a sense her rivals. These are very high ranking people, um, either you know, close to Macron, whatever, and they would be, uh, or very popular, uh, Bruno Le Maire, the finance minister, who announced his own, uh, the fact that he was being uh, returned in the new, when there was a cabinet shuffle recently, uh, he announced it himself. He didn't leave it to the, the prime minister's office to announce it. Um, Gérard Darmanin, who has been, I guess it's a promotion or a lateral move, I'm not sure, from interior minister has now become the budget minister, a rising star also from the right. Edouard Philippe, the former prime minister, who as he never fails to remind everyone is the most popular politician in France. And uh, Francois Bayrou, uh, the leader of Modem, who is um, is not in the in the cabinet, but who is is influential? He's kind of an old timer, so she's under pressure from all these people. Um, the program which Bourne outlined in her general policy speech had nothing new in it. Um, she's sticking to pension reform, which Macron had announced um, ages and ages ago. Uh, but she remained very vague about the age at which the French will retire. Uh, she says that um, this administration will absorb some of France's horrendous budget deficit, but without raising taxes. Uh, and that's kind of hard to square with the fact that they, they're promising another 20 billion euro in spending on cost of living measures. Um, so the only thing that seems to have changed is the, the aspiration for a new method. Uh, Macron has said that he will not, he will abandon his top-down style, the vertical government, if you like. Um, Elisabeth Bourne promised to share power at every level, national and local. 
Um, I have, I'm a little bit skeptical about the extent to which that will happen because I think every president I can remember promised to decentralize and, and share power and so on and, and they just don't, doesn't happen. Um, this week, there is a debate in the National Assembly on a new law on cost of living. And I think this is kind of a taste of, of, of things to come because although there's a consensus in France among all the political parties that times are hard, that inflation is high, um, that the fuel costs are, are, are going up and, and so on, um, there's no consensus in the National Assembly about passing this law. There have been more than 600 amendments already filed. Uh, the rapporteur for the budget committee says that they would, if all of these amendments were passed, it would amount to 100 billion euro in uh, additional expenditure. So I think, I think <laughs> Emmanuel Macron can probably forget about uh, reducing the deficit. Um, Gabriel Attal, who the new budget minister I mentioned a minute ago, uh, has said that France has gone from quoi qu'il en coûte, whatever it cost, which was the slogan during the pandemic, or which is still with us, unfortunately, uh, to combien ça coûte, how much will it cost? Uh, and finally, I mean, if, if it gets really, really messy for Macron, he could use what uh, is called the, the, the atom bomb, the nuclear weapon of French politics, which would be to dissolve the National Assembly and call a new election. Uh, I don't think he will do that. It would, it would have to be very desperate indeed, um, mainly because the French are very unpredictable and there's no guarantee whatsoever that they will vote the same way next time that they voted last time. Uh, and there is a precedent, which was Jacques Chirac, who in 1997, uh, on the urging of Dominique de Villepin, dissolved the National Assembly and it backfired on him and he had to cohabit for five years with the socialist. Um, so I, I think that we're headed for five difficult years, messy years in, in a way, but um, I would like to quote my colleague, Ruan McCormick of, of the Irish Times, who wrote in one of his columns that, what the French call ungovernable, other Europeans call politics. Very good note on which to end, Lara. This whole piece about the, the cost of living, it's obviously so kind of pertinent throughout Europe, but you know, it took such a vivid form in France over the past five years with the, the Gilets Jaunes and that whole kind of movement. And we may come back to it because I do want Emmanuel to come in. That's all right. But I'd be really interested to hear about that, whether that's likely to such a movement is likely to reform or resurge, but I'm digressing. Manuel, would you like to take the floor? Yeah, thanks a million. Um, I'm just going to start maybe to go back, to take us back five years ago. And five years ago, the IIEA invited our deeply missed colleague, Robert Elgy, to comment on the results of the legislative elections, actually. And Robert delivered a kind of speculative talk about the, um, the French party system, where I might go in the next five years. And here we are in 2022, and I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that Robert, as usual, was actually spot on. So Mélenchon indeed now owns what Robert called this large alternative left space. Um, he foresaw, Robert foresaw the 21st century uh, union of the left moment, which Mélenchon managed to achieve. Um, everybody was surprised about this, by the way, that between the presidential election and the legislative election, Mélenchon managed to create this new PES. I'm going to pronounce the S, by the way. I know the uh, Académie Française said not to pronounce it, but I want the social to be in there. Um, it, uh, Robert also foresaw the decline of the Socialist Party to irrelevance. Um, and um, Robert also um, pointed to the continuing struggle of Les Républicains in terms of positioning between Macron and uh, Le Pen. Um, he concluded at the time in 2017 that actually the win of um, La République En Marche signaled the beginning of the change uh, of the French party system and actually not uh, the end. One element he didn't foresee and which Lara uh, mentioned and which actually nobody uh, saw coming was the strength of the Rassemblement National um, in the legislative election. And if you followed the, the, the campaign, uh, even when Marine Le Pen was um, you know, interviewed at the very start of the campaign, uh, you had Mélenchon kind of doing his great coup of uh, pushing people to elect the prime minister, which obviously you don't do in a semi-presidential system, but he sold it to the people. And Marine Le Pen was like, 
this is silly. Uh, we are aiming, you know, we have eight uh, MPs in the outgoing National Assembly. We're aiming to create a group, which uh, um, is at 15. So she was aiming for about 2025. And as Lara mentioned, and Barry, she now has 89. Um, so and and that was without any alliance with Debout la France or Les Républicains or nothing on its own merit and in a uh, two reign majoritarian uh, electoral system. Um, this is quite uh, quite an achievement. Uh, her dad managed to get about thirty five MPs, but when Mitterrand had introduced some proportional representation system to to the electoral uh, system. Um, so I just want to draw maybe three kind of lessons from from um, this political period in France. I I divided into three categories: the electoral lessons, the governmental lessons, and the policy lessons. Just on the electoral lessons, I mean, Lara has mentioned uh, a, a lot of them. Um, we were, I think, we were all surprised how little Macron campaigned. Um, he he waited 22 days to appoint the prime minister, and he just assumed uh, what Robert had actually pointed out in 2017, that there is always a honeymoon, more or less rosy, but always a honeymoon period following the presidential election, and that the president necessarily will have a um, an absolute majority or an overall majority. Um, um, now, he also announced, as Lara mentioned now, but he announced in between the two elections that, uh, that he would um, adopt a new way of governing, but he didn't give any details. And I think that was quite crucial for the NUPES, uh, for, for the Greens, etc. Like, again, no details. He mentioned it and then uh, off he went. The level, uh, something that wasn't mentioned is the level of participation, uh, which was extremely low, less than one in two voters went out to vote. It was higher in 2017, but this time the voters knew a lot was at stake. So um, the, uh, participation seems to settle in the last two elections at below 50%, um, which is again a worrying trend, which Macron had highlighted in 2017, but has done very, very little to uh, combat. Um, the left appears strong. So when you look at it on the face of it, you think, wow, Nupes really scored high, well done. But actually, if you add all the, you know, the, the, the scores of uh, each party, it is the fifth worst score in the Fifth Republic for the, the left bloc. So you can't say that, you know, it's an amazing uh, result. It actually isn't. Um, and in that deal, um, the Socialist Party lost its soul. Like it really sold away, um, you know, things that seem to be values that seem to be very uh, significant uh, and entered, and I'm going to come back to this uh, later on, but entered this deal with a clearly anti-European party um, or group, you know, that um, one way or another wants to Frexit. I mean, there's no kind of uh, way around it. Um, Les Républicains uh, lost half their uh, MPs, but they will be, they should, they can be, they should be, they might be the kingmakers. Um, they have to navigate this, this as Robert highlighted in 2017, they, had, they have to navigate this line between being too complacent and giving too much to Macron uh, or um, appearing as um, rejecting decisions that they would take themselves actually, you know, on pension reform, um, they, would, they would completely support uh, Macron's views, if not more than that actually. Um, and the um, Rassemblement National is finally positioned uh, if it plays its cards uh, right to access power in uh, five years time. This is really, I think, something that needs to be watched. Um, you know, in the past, every media in France and abroad, and, I, and I've been asked several times, oh, will Marie Le Pen win? No. That mathematically, it was no, it wasn't possible, and etc. Um, this time, I'm actually worried. Uh, I just think, like, she has everything, not that she has done much, but she has everything in her power to win. So first of all, um, 
you know, when Robert gave his talk, he was highlighting how the Rassemblement National was divided. You had Marion Maréchal Le Pen, who was in the shadows, and she might come back, she mightn't, etc. But Marion now has left and is with Éric Zemmour in Reconquête. She won't come back, and Reconquête was a huge flop, um, at least in this election. Um, you know, Eric Zemmour argued that Le Pen was associated with failure, 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 election after election. This legislative election was a huge success for the Le Pens. Um, and now she has, Marine Le Pen has 89 MPs. As Lara mentioned, she uh, gave clear instructions. They have to be polite, they have to be civil, they have to wear a suit, a tie. They have to appear respectable, credible. She has five years to build a team to show that it, it's not only her, that she, she will have the manpower, she will have the people. And I'm sure, little by little, some of the Républicains, like Eric Ciotti, might pivot towards her, and she might really extend, as Mélenchon kind of, you know, gobbled up the Socialist Party, I think she could swallow up the kind of further right uh, wing of the Republica. So um, I think she is in an ideal position and she knows it. And the idea that she's not, she wasn't strong enough on immigration, that, you know, she, she, she missed um, the, the, the usual themes of the Rassemblement National, that actually played very well with her electorate. So um, she, she is the danger uh, for the next five years. Um, and as I said, so if you look at NUPES plus Rassemblement National, de la France and a few others, extreme right, um, you have about one in two voters who voted for a, a, a party that advocates leaving or disobeying, etc., uh, the European Union rules and um, not complying not playing ball basically in the European Union. Um, and this is also something uh, that is worrying, that is absolutely not discussed in France. I find it quite surprising that it's absolutely under the radar. Nobody mentions it. Um, we focus on other things, but, but certainly not this. Uh, nobody seemed to be um, surprised that there were that many um, you know, uh, voters who voted for um, anti-European parties. Uh, the governmental lessons quite short. Um, so Macron is about 40, 43 seats short of an absolute majority. He tried and Elisabeth Bourne clearly um, made public that she tried to um, speak to the different groups and uh, to the different political parties to create uh, co a coalition government, as Barry said, or as Larry said, actually, most European democracies uh, function like this. Not France. Uh, France is um, is still uh, kind of uh, functioning on this idea of an absolute um, or an overall majority uh, and a government that uh, has full power. Um, Macron picked a woman M uh, prime minister. Um, there were talks that after the results of the legislative election, he might uh, get rid of her. That would have been a huge mistake. So he didn't. <laughs> um, She's been attacked for being technocratic, um, quite boring, quite cold. Um, but what's interesting, and I think it could play in her favor and in Macron's favor, therefore, she's not too political. She's an engineer. She's from Polytechnique, uh, whereas we've had only ENA people, largely, ENA or lawyers, you know. So she's more in the doing rather than the talking. Um, she could really, uh, and she's well known for being a good negotiator. So she she could be the, the right woman, not too politically identified. And now she's picked a government very much uh, to her image. So no big figures apart from, as Lara mentioned, um, Gérald Darmanin and um, Le Maire. Um, but you know, not uh, apart from that, uh, you know, the, the other like Minister for Health and etc. and uh, not too politically um, strong. Um, we can discuss the Minister for Education, which created a, a few waves actually, um, or who created a few waves when he was appointed, but we'll wait and see. Um, and really, French political culture isn't about making deals. Um, um, and uh, there was no, you know, um, government agreement in advance uh, of, of um, the, uh, the speech on 
general policy uh, speech that uh, Bourne uh, delivered, she mentioned the leaders of the parliamentary groups of, except for NUPES and Rassemblement National, clearly trying to bring them in to kind of say, we're, I'm focusing on compromise here. And as Lara mentioned, certainly uh, parliamentary politics is back in terms of well, they have no choice anyway, uh, but in terms of trying to uh, to um, construct um, and, and build compromises. Um, and my last point will be on policy lessons um, nationally. I mean, Lara mentioned a lot about the, the law and the cost of living. Macron is still aiming for his pension reform. Um, he has to do a pension reform. Now, it will be a very watered down version of what he has. But if he doesn't, he would be the first president in 40 years not to have carried out a pension reform, which is absolutely needed. Um, he has to deal with, inf with inflation, obviously, um, uh, but France is already, and Lara mentioned all this, but France is already probably over the 5% um, in, in terms of public deficit in 2022. Ger the German economy in, is in a huge, um, is in a significant difficult position uh, with the massive reduction in Russian gas. If like the the German economy collapses or not collapses, but you know struggles deeply. Uh, it will have ripple waves, uh, and certainly all across Europe. But it will affect France, obviously. Um, so it's it's a very difficult economic uh, and therefore social um, time ahead of Macron at a European level, because Macron at the end of the day is therefore the last. Um, pro-European uh, leader uh, on, on, the, on the spectrum. Uh, France just finished its um, presidency of the council. Uh, it was deemed successful, which wasn't a given because France not, hasn't always had successful presidencies, but it was deemed quite successful with key decisions in the field of the environment. You had obviously the Digital Market Act and the Digital Services Act that were passed and that was, um, that was important. The universal charges uh, decision was, was uh, agreed, uh, minimum wage in all member states and et cetera, et cetera. So the strategic compass and obviously uh, and very important symbolically for Macron as well, uh, given what he had been, what he said about Ukraine and Russia and etc. But the, the candidate status was granted to Ukraine and Moldova during the French presidency. Um, and as we remember, the Romanian uh, president and, the, and uh, Draghi and Macron went uh, to, to deliver the news to um, to Ukraine. Um, so just to conclude, um, Macron, okay, uh, Macron has five very difficult years of uh, ahead of him. Um, I was reading a, a piece, and I, I kind of understand this as well, saying that the situation he's in now is worse than a cohabitation, because in a cohabitation, he could be, he could he, he would place himself as the referee, you know, above kind of daily politics. Um, and he would let the PM uh, deal with uh, the mundane day-to-day -day, uh, policies in extremely difficult times. But here he's in probably the worst of, of both worlds, actually. Um, if you remember in 2017, the Time magazine uh, did a cover page where you had a, a profile shot of Macron and the, the headline was, he wants to be the new leader of Europe. And there was a little asterisk and then it said, um, if only uh, he, he can lead France. And I think that summarizes, um, you know, Macron's presidency from 2017 and probably until 2027. Uh, Macron cannot be um, re-elected as well. So he's um, he's a president, you know, like as, as uh, Lara mentioned, 2027 is already being in discussed. Edouard Philippe is on the ranks, Gérald Darmanin, Bruno Le Maire, they're all competing for that spot. Um, and um, ultimately, I think there will be, yes, parliamentary politics will be back, but as Lara mentioned, the extremes, well, NUPES will be extremely disruptive. Um, Clémentine Autain had said during uh, the presidential campaign, um, if Mélenchon is elected president, we will still carry on demonstrating uh, and complaining in the streets. And I, I was like, right, so politics at, uh, at its uh, most difficult. Um, 
the Les Républicains won't want to compromise uh, their future by appearing too complacent, as I said, with Macron and the leader of the group, Olivier Marlex, is a hardliner anti-Macron. Um, and um, Macron now has to prepare his uh, legacy. And I fear really that it will be a, a, a kind of Obama type legacy with Trump coming uh, after Obama. Uh, I fear in 2027, we could be discussing Marine Le Pen president. That's it.